us join together with our call to worship. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Is Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, forgive us when the cries of Hosanna fall too easily from our lips. We know that we have within us the potential to cry crucify as well. May we not be so deafened by the roar of the crowd, nor so blinded by the waving of palms that we forget your way leads to the cross. Forgive us for easy faith and swallow praise. Make us faithful followers of your way, even the way of the cross. Amen. Yes, Lord. Forgive us when our Sunday worship gives way too easily to weekday denials. Forgive us when we, like Judas, have betrayed you. Forgive us when we, like Peter, have denied you. Forgive us for every failure, every shortcoming, every sin. Father, we thank you because that is exactly why you sent Christ, the Messiah, Christ, the precious Lamb of God, our Savior. Why you sent Christ to come, to die on the cross in our place for the forgiveness of all our sin, to cleanse us so that we might be white as snow. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of all our betrayals, all our denials, all our failures, all our shortcomings. We thank you for the forgiveness of all our sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Read the Palm Sunday account in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, one which no one has ever ridden. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say, The Lord has need of it. Those who were sent ahead found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? 
They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It was October 29th, 1927. Charles Lindbergh was given a ticker tape parade in New York City. Why? To honor him for his solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean. 750,000 pounds of ticker tape poured down on the streets of New York City. But the biggest ticker tape parade was on March 1st. 1962. It was given for astronaut John Glenn after he became the first American to orbit the Earth. The sanitation department cleaned up 3,474 tons of ticker tape, confetti, and other paper. 3,474 tons. If you do the math, that is almost 7 million pounds. Everybody loves a parade. And it was no different on Palm Sunday when Jesus came to town. The Jewish historian Josephus estimated the crowd in Jerusalem back then to be about 3 million people, about half the population of Judea and Galilee. They weren't all there because of Jesus. They were there to celebrate Passover. But there was a crowd gathered on the Mount of Olives and they celebrated Jesus. That first Palm Sunday, it was a parade, a pep rally, a worship service, and more. But for the most part, for many in the crowd, it really, to be quite honest about it, it was just a sham. Within a few short days, the crowd had disappeared and the cheers turned to jeers. I wonder, I wonder what happens after Sunday in our world today. You know, sometimes, sometimes when we think about Palm Sunday, I, I think that often we focus too much on the crowd. I think that sometimes we focus so much on the crowd that we tend to forget about Jesus. After all, he is the reason for the season. Have you ever stopped to look into the face of Jesus on Palm Sunday? Have you ever stopped to focus on the face of Jesus as he comes riding into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday? The crowds are gathered there. They're lay laying their coats on the road in front of him. The children are running all around him. 
everyone is waving palm branches. By, by the way, do you know that Rome had outlawed palm branches in the city of Jerusalem? Oh, not on the trees. You really couldn't do that, could you? But Rome had outlawed the cutting of palm branches or the waving of palm branches, anything to do with palm branches, because Rome saw palm branches as a symbol of revolt. It was a symbol of independence on the part of the Jew. So when the Jews in welcoming Jesus that first Palm Sunday, as they were cutting down palm branches, as they were waving palm branches, it was in the eyes of Rome, a declaration of independence. It was an act of revolution. So the people are laying their coats on the road in front of Christ. Children are running all around him. The people are waving palm branches. They're singing praises. They're shouting Hosanna. And Christ is enjoying every moment of it. Think about it. In the past, Jesus had silenced the crowds. Whenever he would heal someone, he always said, now, don't tell anyone. Keep quiet about it. But not today. He's enjoying everything that's going on. He's enjoying all the attention. He's got the biggest grin on his face. The biggest grin you've ever seen. Because you see, Christ knows what this means. And so do the Pharisees. All this is fulfilled in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice great, greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And when you read Matthew's account, you see that the people are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Which, by calling Jesus the son of David, the people are proclaiming that he is the Messiah. Everything that's going on is a declaration that Christ is the Messiah. The one sent by God. Everything that's going on is proof of who Jesus is. That's why the Pharisees are so angry. That's why they demand that Jesus silence the crowd. In reality, what the Pharisees are saying is, Jesus set the people straight. Tell them that you are not the Messiah. And Jesus says, if the people are silenced, the rocks will cry out. In reality, what he's saying is, it's all true. I am. Remember, that's a name of God. I am. That's what God said to Moses way back in Exodus. And that's what Jesus is. I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I am the Son of God. I am God. And if the people don't acknowledge me, the rocks will acknowledge me. The people are crying out, Hosanna, a Hebrew term. It literally means save. Save us. First of all, I think that what the people, what they mean, what they are saying is, Jesus, save us from our Roman oppressors. 
Save us the way we want to be saved. Jesus, our way, not your way, our way, not God's way. I wonder, isn't that often what we want? I mean, I wonder, isn't that the way we pray? The people, the people saw in Christ the fulfillment of prophecy. The people saw in Christ the answer to all their hopes, all their dreams. The people saw in Christ the coming of the kingdom of God. The problem was they just didn't know what any of that meant. They didn't truly understand prophecy. They didn't understand how God would fulfill their hopes and their dreams. They didn't understand the meaning of the kingdom of God. What? the kingdom of God would actually look like. Maybe, maybe the real problem was they didn't understand who God was. Maybe the real problem was they just didn't really know God. I wonder I wonder, do, do we understand? Do we truly know God? The people didn't understand. I don't think they really knew God. And that's why the cheers turned to jeers. That's why the shouts of Hosanna turned to shouts of crucify, crucify. Just for the moment, just for the moment on Sunday, Christ was king and the people praised him. I wonder, are we ever like the crowd? Is it ever just for the moment on Sunday? I wonder what happens after Sunday. The great evangelist Billy Graham has been quoted many times as saying that the greatest mission field in the world today is the local church. The people already sitting in the church. Now, I'm not sure whether his statement is true or not. But one thing I do know is that there are many people that do sit in the pew. There, there are many people that they know the right thing to say. They know the right thing to do. But when the rubber really hits the road, there's no relationship, only ritual. Just for the moment, just for the moment on Sunday, I wonder. You know, life was rosy on Sunday, but 
by Monday, everything was starting to go downhill. I guess Jesus never read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because on Monday, Jesus started making enemies. He went to the temple and he overturned the tables and drove the money changers out. And he said the priests had turned the temple into a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. Jesus didn't give any speeches to rally the people against Rome. He wasn't recruiting an army to overthrow the oppressors. People were waiting for him to act. But he wasn't. And so the people were disappointed. And that disappointment began to turn to anger. This man from Nazareth, he was supposed to be their Messiah, their Savior, but he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. At least not what they thought he was supposed to do. He wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. When it became apparent that Christ wasn't going to do what they wanted him to do, when it became apparent that he wasn't going to give them what they wanted him to give them, the crowd turned against him. I wonder. Are we ever like that? Three years ago, my sister Nancy passed away. I still remember a conversation I had with her one son, Angel. Nancy had adopted her two boys and she was a single mother. There's a man in her church, a man by the name of Ron that became a male role model for Nancy's two boys. A male role model that was very sorely needed for Nancy's two boys since they were boys of color. Sadly, Ron developed cancer. Nancy and the boys and the whole church prayed for Ron that God would heal Ron, but unfortunately, it was not to be. Ron passed away. Before Nancy's death, I remember talking with Angel, an angry young man. And I remember Angel telling me, we prayed for Ron and God didn't heal him. I'm praying for my mom. But if God doesn't heal my mom, I am done with God. And right now, Angel's done with God. I wonder... Are we ever like Angel? I wonder, are we ever like the crowd? I wonder, do we ever tell God, God, it has to be my way or else? You know, it was just the opposite with Christ. In the garden, the night in which he was betrayed, 
the night before he was crucified, Christ prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thy will be done. That's how we should pray. Uh, it is easy to be a Christian on Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. Who wouldn't want to be with Christ at a time like that? Sundays are easy. Sundays are good. Sundays are days of fellowship, days of singing, days of praising. Sundays are generally a good day for us. But what about Monday and Tuesday and the rest of the week? See, during the week, those are the days that we struggle. Those are the days that we work. We pay bills. We go to the doctor. We cut the grass. We wash the clothes. Those are the days that we deal with life. Sometimes the good, but lots of times the bad and the ugly. Sunday, Sundays are the days that prepare us for the things that happen the rest of the week. Sundays are the days that are supposed to strengthen our faith and this Sunday, this Sunday was even more special because it was Palm Sunday. It's easy to be a Christian on Sunday, especially on Palm Sunday. It's easy to be a Christian just for the moment. But I wonder what happens the rest of the week. In our Bible study, we've been studying in 1 Samuel and now 2 Samuel. And to fully understand Palm Sunday, we have to go back to what happens in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8, when Samuel was judge and prophet, and priest, and getting old. And his sons who should follow him are corrupt and immoral and incapable of following him. And so the elders get together and they ask Samuel to appoint for them a king, which on the surface, sounds reasonable, given Samuel's sons. But their explanation, we want a king so that we can be like everyone else. All the other nations have a king. We want a king like all the other nations. Samuel knew that that was not God's plan. So he prays about it. And God says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And God says, give them what they want. The reality, history shows us that most of the kings were terrible. Most of the kings took them in the wrong direction. Most of the kings took them in a path that led to destruction, but they got what they wanted. And centuries went by without a king at all. They, Israel was led, was ruled by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, 
And at the time of the first Palm Sunday, they were under the oppressive rule, the iron fist rule of the Romans. The people were beaten down, but they remembered. They remembered God's promise of a Messiah and they have hopes and dreams and they believe that the Messiah will fix everything. They believe that the Messiah will put everything back together the way they want it to be. They're not thinking about the way God wants it to be, but the way they want it to be. I wonder, is that the way we think? When Jesus showed up, he seemed to be the long-awaited Messiah. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He spoke with authority like no one else. This time, the people did have the right person. Indeed, Jesus was the Messiah. He was the long-awaited king. But Jesus wasn't the kind of king that people wanted. He wasn't the kind of king, the kind of Messiah that they wanted him to be. I wonder, is Jesus the kind of king, the kind of Messiah that we want him to be? Jesus wanted what wasn't what they wanted, and so they had him crucified. I wonder when Jesus isn't what we want him to be, what do we do with him? Father God, this Palm Sunday, help us to fo focus on Jesus, the Messiah, your precious Lamb of God, the one come not just to free us from an oppressive state, but the one come to set us free from sin, free from the wages of sin, free from death. Lord, help us to realize that Jesus doesn't always do things the way we want. He doesn't always give us exactly what we want, but Jesus came to give us exactly what we need. And help us to realize that that is always all we need. Yes, Lord, help us to focus on Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the precious, precious Lamb of God. Behold, what manner of love. For God so loved. Greater love has no man than this. How much did Jesus love you, this precious Lamb of God? He loved enough to suffer. Not an inch of his body was free from pain. As the thorns dug into his brow. Tears rolled down the face of Christ. Still, they laughed and mocked. He loved the whole world with the greatest of loves. But still, their hearts were locked. Even his followers deserted him. In fear, they ran away, running from an army to save their own lives without a word to say. Pilate refused to try the case. Where is the crime? He said. But God stubborn. Religious people cried. We want this imposter dead. 
the people who worshipped him a week ago were screaming, Kill the fool! He says he wants to be our king, but we'll not let him rule. The soldiers tortured this perfect man who suffered both sorrow and pain. They took him to a mound of skulls as thunder gave birth to rain. It seemed as if the drops of rain that fell from the sky were drops of tears from far away as God the Father began to cry. Down came the hammer onto the nail, down through his wrists that bled. With a purple robe that mocked him as king and crown of thorns on his head. The old splintered beam where Jesus was nailed was lifted high in the air then dropped in the ground with a loud, painful sound in view of the crowd's silent stare. The, the people, people who cried for Jesus' Jesus death stood, stood watching a man, man brave and, and true. And in his last lonely, dying breath, he said, I'm dying for you. There must have been silence in heaven that evening. Michael. Gabriel. The prophets. The host of saints, too many to count. Jesus' lifeless body. The Lamb of God. Beaten. Bruised. Spit upon. Bludgeoned. Mocked. This, this holy, holy Lamb, Lamb of, of God, God. Pierced. Broken. Scourged. Bleeding. Lamb, Lamb of God. God the, the holy Lamb, Lamb of God. God. And as we remember Jesus, the Lamb of God, let us pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done, done on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily, daily bread. And, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, may our God, whose arms were spread on the cross to take our sins and embrace us all in his love, may he enable us this week to take up our cross and follow him now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.